with my pleasure that I introduce you Dominic Lakatos from the German Aerospace Center, DLR, which will uh, talk about uh, the use of variable stiffness actuators in uh, cyclic motions. Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for the introduction and for the invitation. So the organizers gave the title VSA in cyclic motion, but I think it's better to say cyclic motions of VSA robots because cyclic motions are an intrinsic property of variable stiffness actuators, which I want to show in this presentation. So what's the motivation? The motivation is having performant motion like why the videos are not going sorry. <coughs> Like here, as you can see, jumping or crawling or running and so on. And the goal is to be as efficient and, and to reach the performance of these biological archetypes. So all this, this, all this task has one property together. So the motion is cyclic. <coughs> that means that the states reach the original state after a certain period. Which you see here, after a certain period t. So, but what you can also see in this motion, this is an example for a, for a double pendulum cyclic motion, that the motion will be highly nonlinear. This is due to maybe contacts with the environment and the nonlinear rigid body dynamics and the nonlinearities in the springs and so on. So, I guess this one I can skip. So, I think everybody knows that. Variable stiffness actuators are strongly motivated by the musculoskeletal system. So we have always the, the arrangement having a motor in series with a spring acting on the next link. Okay, that, that's the motivation. Um, so I will split my talk in actually five parts. The first part is the problem st statement where I say, say something about the model which I use, and uh, then I say something about introducing nonlinear springs, what the problem is thereby, and about what the problem is when you have a nonlinear system with multiple degrees of freedom. Then I will present a model-based method to generate a limit cycle for a multi-degree of freedom system, and afterwards a model-free approach which is actually uh, the approach which, which I use mainly in my works. And then I, I, I present another method which is in between the model base and the model free. And then I will explain also some advanced concepts of cyclic tasks such as walking or running. Okay. Um, Let's start with the model. So I consider always this general model. So this model has at the coordinate x, which can be separated in a coordinate theta and q. So I only present this separation to, to, to tell you that uh, um, we have motor coordinates, theta, and link coordinates. So, and they are not the same, which is, uh, property of the variable stiffness actuators. And therefore also the generalized torque which acts on this dynamics can be, is composed of the motor torques and external torques. So the motor torques, uh, the motor torques are the control input always and the external uh, torques only act on the, on the rigid body dynamics. So then furthermore we have a gravity potential and the elastic potential. So this one is the potential of the variable stiffness actuators. And then, then I assume also for my approaches, and I think which is an intrinsic property of every physical system, that we have a damping here. So the only, let's say, requirement on this damping force is that it fulfills these property so that the force um, is such that it dissipates energy out of the system, always. 
Okay. Um, yeah, as I mentioned already, this one is considered as the control input. So just to, just to repeat it, so the control input acts only on the motor coordinates and the external torques acts on, acts on the rigid body coordinates. Okay. Um, sometimes it is it is has the advantage to make a reduction or a simplification on this model. So this here I just repeat it again. So if you use uh, for the motor coordinates, if you use a very strong PD controller, then you can show by a singular perturbation theory that you can reduce your model to only having the rigid body dynamics and then having a new control input theta. So that means that you can consider the motor position instead of the motor torque as a control input. It's the same as you can always, if, if you move the motor, so if you move the, the, move the one point of the springs to move the link, and that's, that's valid because um, usually in variable stiffness actuators, your, your controller gains, uh, the stiffness of your PD controller, can be much higher than the stiffness of your, of your joints or of your VSA mechanism. Okay, that, that are all the modeling assumptions I make. And then now let me explain what is the problem if you have nonlinear springs. So here on the top, you can see the equation of maybe one joint connected to a linear spring mechanism here with the constant stiffness, so m, d, and k all are constant. And what we all know is if we choose yet now for the motor position, which is now our control input, the sinusoidal excitation, then we all know from, from linear system theory that we get a harmonic resonance here at the natural frequency of the system. That is very clear, I think, and also well known, or should be well known for everyone. But if we now introduce, an, instead of this linear spring here, a nonlinear spring, so I think the simplest example for a nonlinear spring would be a cubic spring, so a spring with a linear part and a cubic part, then we result in this equation. So this row is maybe known as the duffing oscillator. And due to the, let's say, the serious elastic actuator, so we have the spring not only on the, on the link position, but on the difference between the motor and the link position. And therefore, some mixed term result here. So here we see our control input in the power of one. It's the same as in the linear model. But in addition, we have the control input in the power of three. And then we have some combination, combination terms here, which, which results from the, because we have the deflection is, is at the motor position minus the link position. So, and they have some influ influence. So in perturbation theory, these terms are considered as, as parametric excitations. And this term is a multi-frequency excitation because when you, ha when you have here, when you take for theta here, this sinusoidal excitation and take the power of three, then you will get out a different frequency. I think that's clear to everyone. So, so that means due to the nonlinearity, you get a parametric excitation and the multi-frequency excitation. In addition to the nonlinearity here on the spring on Q. So that's one issue, but let's neglect this one and look just on the frequency response of the remaining equation here. And there is one very big difference between the frequency response of the linear system. So here, you have one harmonic resonance frequency, but 
in the, in the nonlinear case, you can see you can have multiple harmonic frequencies. So the, the harmonic, the resonance frequency is not unique. That means that your steady state of your oscillation, which you get out, will depend on your initial condition. So if you start with an initial amplitude for your, for your Q, then you can maybe reach this point or this point of the resonance. So with, with this whole example, I want only to show that it makes a big difference if you have a linear spring or a nonlinear spring when you want to have a cyclic motion. So that, that's one of the, let's say, big theoretical problems you have. Another one comes from, from the multi-body dynamics. So everybody knows if you have a double pendulum without damping, so I hope that the video will start. The motion which results is chaotic. Yeah, that means, but the, in this, from this it becomes clear that there will be no oscillation mode as you have in a linear system. So in a linear system you can make eigenvalue analysis and you, then you can find out the oscillation modes and they are clearly separated then you can excite one of them, but this one is not possible if you have a if you, if you have multi-body dynamics as, a, as you have in, for rigid robots. So, there, what, what the result is that the that the, the the notion of linear eigenmodes cannot be applied to non-linear rigid body dynamics. So this are I guess the two big problems we have to deal when we want to generate cyclic motions for, for multi-degree of freedom VSA systems. So we can summarize. So what I, what I mentioned with the introduction of the, of the model, so the plant dynamics is under -actuated. Then but we can use the motor position instead of the motor torque as control input, which makes things a little bit easier. Yeah, but when we have nonlinear springs, which usually results if you have a variable stiffness mechanism, then you have difficulties when you want to have a harmonic excitation. And linear eigenmodes cannot be applied to the to the nonlinear plant dynamics of, of variable stiffness robots. Okay, then let's start with the first approach, um, the model-based approach. So, or maybe are there some questions at this point? So I divided the talk in several parts where I make summaries in between. So. You can ask every time, but maybe this, that would be a good time to ask some questions. Are there some questions? Yeah? This one? Yeah. What was the reason to cancel all the multi-frequency excitations and the excitation? That's, that's just, um, just to separate the effects. So in per perturbation theory, you can consider usually different time scales and maybe this effect due to this term is in a different time scale than the one we can consider with this one, also for this one. So that would mean that we here we just neglect the frequencies, the frequency range, which results due to this term. So it's just, so you can say even with this, when you neglect this term, then the problem is still such difficult. Okay. 
Okay, then let's go on with the model-based approach. So, the principle of the control approach is having one controller part, which makes the decoupling. I wrote here modal decoupling. It will become later clear why it's called modal decoupling. Then we have one part for generating a limit cycle on a decoupled mode. And then we have one part because this all stuff is related to second order dynamics. So it's oscillations in second order dynamics. But we have the under actuated plant, which is a fourth order dynamic. And then we need, therefore, we need a controller to bring the second order behavior to the plant. Okay. Um, the idea between the modal decoupling is that here we consider a variable stiffness robot, and let's assume that all the motors in the joints are fixed to a fixed position. So if you now here disturb or elongate the end effector only by a small amount, then you will have an oscillation. And maybe if the if this the amplitude of your excitation or of your elongation here is small enough then it will be approximately linear. But it will become clear if you make a, want to, to, uh, to have an oscillation with a bigger amplitude, then something strange, maybe chaotic, or, but not, not a limit cycle or not a periodic motion would result. So the idea of this modal decoupling controller is to extend this local behavior to a global e behavior by control. And then if you have this global if you have this global decoupled behavior, then you can take one of these modes out and generate a limit cycle along this mode. And this, this can be done, for example, based on principles of the Van der Poel oscillator, which I will explain later. Yeah. But that's the basic idea. To take the local, approximately linear be behavior and extend the, the valid range to, to the global one. So let's put it in formulas. So I already mentioned that oscillation dynamics are usually uh, second order dynamics. So I start with the, with, for the derivation with the rigid body dynamics of the links. So, and yeah, but we have to remember that here, this is the torque that would be only the control input if you have a rigid robot but since we have a VSA robot, this is not our control input. So later on, when we design the dynamics, we need some controller to bring the behavior, the second order behavior, to our fourth order, to our under actuated system by some joint torque control or feedback linearization, as you heard maybe on Saturday from, from Alessandro Le Luca. So some method is required later on. Okay, then, but this dynamics is still not a oscillation dynamics. So you know that it's, it's just a mess, so a multi-body system um, composed of different bodies. So you this one ha would have a chaotic behavior, but not not uh, oscillation behavior. So what we do first, we define here a control input we make, which makes the oscillation behavior out of this dynamics. So that we can set uh, some in center point of the oscillation. We define here a control error for the, for the link position. And this results in an oscillation dynamics. So actually it's just a PD controller plus, plus some additional terms. So it's, it's more or less a PD plus controller 
with where the Coriolis are cancelled out. So, yeah, that this cancelling of the Coriolis can be a problem for the stability, but I think that's an issue which I want, don't want to dis discuss in detail. So, the resulting dynamics is here a second order oscillation dynamics with a, a mass, a damping, and a stiffness. And this is our new control input. So, and for this oscillation dynamics, we will, I will derive now the controller, which will make the decoupling, so which will extend this local behavior to the global one. So, and therefore, we consider eigenvalue decomposition, generalized eigenvalue decomposition, which means that here we have our inertia matrix and our stiffness matrix, and if if we apply the, this dia double diagonalization, then we get the identity matrix for the for the inertia and a diagonal matrix for the stiffness, where the entries at the di the diagonal entries are the eigenvalues. So the the square root of them would be the eigenfrequencies. So and then we design a damping term. Yeah, you remember this this D? This comes from the controller, so we can set the D. And we de we we design it in the diagonal space. So what results? So from this eigenvalue decomposition we get out a linear transformation. Yeah? A linear but state dependent transformation which results in this decoupled dynamics. So this one is a, the well-known well oscillation dynamics. The only difference to the, to the one which you know maybe is that the eigenvalues depend on the configuration. And, but on this side, some terms are remaining here. And these are the, the coupling terms which, which, which you which w would avoid if you, which, which make the coupling that you, that you cannot have the global behavior. <coughs> so if you elongate the system more or too much, then this top coupling terms would be so large that in each mode you will have an oscillation and then it would get chaotic. So what the controller actually did, uh, does is, um, Cancelling this remaining coupling, term, coupling terms, and as a result, this dynamics, this decoupled dynamics, will result. So this is a simulation for a for a double pendulum where you can see this decoupled, or here this one is the coupled behavior, where I give a step. On, on one of the oscillation modes, so the first one is maybe in blue, and the second one, second oscillation mode is not damped, and the first one is damped. And what you can see here, you get an you get oscillation on both modes, so on the blue one, on the first mode, on the, on the green one, on the second mode. Same you can see here in the velocity. And if you apply now this decoupling control, then you see you get only here, here you see a response on the first mode, but the second mode remains zero. So it's not moving. So that, there you can see the effect from this decoupling control. But you already see the amplitude and the velocity. So that's not a that's not a small oscillation, though that's not a local approximation, so that's a that's a global behavior. Okay, so now we have the part which decouples our our multiple degree of freedom system. So and the next step would be to to generate a limit cycle on this mode. And this will be made based on uh, energy controller, which take the energy on the case mode, so of one of your mode which you select. So this one is the total energy, this one is the kinetic part, 
this one is the potential pump. And what the controller does is adding a nonlinear damping term such that the actual energy, total energy on this mold, converge to a desired value, to a desired constant value. So if you like, I can present you the der derivation of this controller that stays open for you who like the, to hear the derivation of the controller. So it's a very basic concept. Yeah? One against 30 or? <laughs> okay, yeah. I think we have the time to do it. So, um, yeah, for the derivation, I start with the very simple. So I just take a single joint. I take also linear, but it, it works also for nonlinear. That makes conceptually no difference. So this one is a single joint with a mass and a stiffness. And here, the torque is considered as control input. So if we look at the total energy of the system, so here, H, is here we have the kinetic part and the potential part. And we can easily see that the, that the time derivative along the trajectory of the system is here, is just tau times q dot. So that's the power of the system. So the torque times the velocity. And now if we consider a Lyapunov function, which is just the squared, squared error of the actual total system energy and the desired one. When, when we make the derivative, then we get out here a term which should be always non-positive. Yeah? If this is always non-positive, then we know that, that V, so this Lyapunov function, converge to zero, and then we know that here h converges to h desired. So we have to make this term non-positive, and this can be easily seen that it's, that can be achieved by a, by a torque of this form. So it's again the error between the desired and the actual total system energy times the velocity, and this one is again it's a design parameter. And if you substitute this term here, you will see that you get out a semi-definite derivative of the Lyapunov function. So what you can see from this term and from this term is that the error between the desired and the actual uh, total system energy will converge to zero. So, and this here is the resulting dynamics, the, so the, the closed loop dynamics. And this has a very similar structure to the Van der Poel oscillator. So we have here a term, so when the energy is too, let's say too small, then you are in, inside from the limit cycle, then there will be a force which will, you, which will attract you to the limit cycle. And the same is if you are outside, then it will go in the direction to, to, to the inside, the limit cycle. Okay. And that's actually the principle which is used at, at one of the oscillation modes. So hopefully I can show you the video. Uh -huh. So here the blue one is the motion of the first oscillation mo mode and the green one of the second, the red one on the third. And these are real robot experiments, so that's why they are not exactly decoupled due to modeling errors and sensor errors and so on, but it's, I think it's quite good already. And here you can see how it reacts to a disturbance. So when you manually catch the arm and release it, so it converges back to the limit cycle. Yeah. 
this, it works also in a different configuration. And the interesting thing here is it works also for, for the second mode. So you can really select which, which mode you want to, want to have for your oscillation. So in the third mode, the energy is too high, so the frequency will be too high, so I have no experiments for the third, third mode. Okay, so in summary, with this model-based method, we achieved um, uh, an ex extension of a local property, so the local linear property, or approximately linear property, to, to the global. And yeah, therefore it was possible to apply <coughs> A concept based on the Van der Poel oscillator on this oscillation mode. So that was only, we could only apply this Van der Poel oscillator to, to, to the robot because we had, because of the decoupling. When, it, when you have not, a, not this decoupling, then you can drive maybe the, the total energy of the robots to a constant value, but that will not result in a cyclic motion because that could be something. So it could be something in between. Maybe it will reach again the same point. But constant energy means not, means not uh, having a cyclic motion. So it, it have, has to be constant on one coordinate. So the energy along one coordinate direction has to be constant. And yeah, but we derived the method for the rigid body dynamics. So we have to remember, we have to apply a controller to implement it for the for the for the VSA robot, and that requires maybe a joint torque control, maybe by feedback linearization or backstepping or other methods, and therefore we require a very accurate model of the plant, and we need high derivatives. So to implement this presented controller, we need up to the fourth derivative of the measured link position. So this, the third derivative can be achieved, maybe or can be computed based on the rigid body model, but the, 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 the fourth one we neglected, so it's really difficult. So that's why we were looking also for, for different methods, which have not the strong requirements on the model and the, on, and, and the derivative of measured signals. So, yeah, maybe at this point, are there questions? Yeah. Can you just please repeat the summary? What do you want to do? The complete? Can you repeat the summary? What do you want the robot to do? Why do you want so, exciting motions and what is happening in the inside? So what we, yeah, you are right for the, for the, for the robot arm, maybe it's not so intuitive what is the task in behind the cyclic task. But at time, we have only a robot arm. But I think f you could apply this also for, for a walking robot, for a legged robot. And then a cyclic task could be jumping or running. So any or many locomotion tasks are cyclic. But at time we have only the arm, so we we develop the concepts for the arm. What is in cycle? What, what, what does it mean in cycle? I don't. I never. Yeah, a limit cycle is a isolated orbit, so you can have a it's it's it's, it's a cycle in the state plane. So if you have the if you plot the velocity over the position, then it's a cycle, but which is attractive, which means that if you start with initial condition, not on the limit cycle, but maybe inside or outside, then it will attract you to the limit cycle. Are there other questions?
Okay, then I would go on with the model free part. So the idea behind the model free part comes from from observations. Here, here's one example of exciting a swing. And yeah, when exciting a swing, yeah, you you may observe that there are two important issues. So one is the timing when you push the swing, huh? and then the other one is the direction of the excitation. So if you push the swing in the wrong direction, then it will maybe stop the the oscillation. So, and what you can see here, the guy here is initially pushing the swing, maybe more or less randomly, and then he's observing the resulting oscillation. After next time the swing comes to him, and then we, he maybe have, had already improved the, the excitation. And that he will so, do so often, or re repeat this process, until he, the, his excitation is such good that he uh, need almost no energy to sustain the oscillation. So, and that brings us to the idea that we have to excite the intrinsic mechanical oscillation modes of the plant to have an efficient cyclic motion. Okay, so I repeat this. There are two parts. One is the timing of the excitation, and the other one is the direction. And first I will present a method for the timing. Okay, and this is, uh, co that will result in a control law which is based only on switchings of the motor position. So, I again consider first only a single joint, here a mass, then a damping term, and here the elastic potential of my spring. Here, phi is the spring deflection, so it's, it's the difference in spring potential, and the diff spring phi is the, the difference between the motor and the, uh, the, the link and the motor position. Okay, and yeah, it's assumed as usual that all plant parameters are positive definite, so it's a physical plant with physical spring and damping and so on. And the control law which we suggest, which, and which solves this timing problem, is a simple switching law, which observes only the spring deflection, and if the spring deflection is greater than a threshold, then the motor position will switch by a constant amount. So for completeness here, the theta, theta minus is the state of the motor before the switching, because switching is an instantaneous control action, so that's the state before the switching. And here, theta hat is the switching constant. So the motor position can be either zero, or theta hat, plus theta hat, or minus theta hat. And that's dependent on, on the spring deflection, or it could be, could be equivalently also the, the torque, the spring torque. So, and the, the behavior of the controller you can see in this video. So here in green is the motor position, in blue is the link position, and due to the switching you can see here it reached a limit cycle. So it's a very simple principle. But, and what you can see also here is that you need to measure only the spring deflection for the control law. That's the only thing which you need to generate the limit cycle. No derivatives. So, but the analysis, if you really reach a limit cycle here, is, 
is therefore more complicated than in the other case. So in the following I will present only the basic ideas of the stability analysis. Yeah, if you like we could also skip this part. <laughs> Someone who don't want to hear the stability analysis? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there are concepts maybe which can be applied for not only for, for limit cycle, but for, let's say, for every hybrid dynamics which results when you have contacts with, with variable stiffness robots. Okay. Um, yeah. For the system analysis, we consider the system as a hybrid system, which is in literature also known as a differential automata. So this is the closed loop dynamics, which can be separated in a con continuous dynamics, which you can see here, and a finite dynamics. So this is actually just a state machine which switches the motor position here based on measurements of the spring deflection. But since the motor deflection, uh, the motor position um, has always either the value of zero or theta hat or minus theta hat, the, you, you can see that the, that the finite dynamics depends only on the state Q and the state of the, the dynamics itself. Okay, and yeah, uh, a big analysis tool for such type of system was introduced by Brannicki in the end of the 90s, and yeah, this one, this one is piecewise continuous from the left, it's not so. And yeah, it's based on multiple Japanov functions for so the idea is to separate the whole system in subsystems. Each subsystem has a continuous dynamics itself. And then what the state machine is doing is just switching between the subsystems. Here, yeah, it's a different representation. So here, this, the vector field is switched dependent on a switching signal. And yeah, here you can represent the whole dynamics as a so as as this vector field which is switched by a state machine which is presented here. Okay. Yeah, maybe this is a detail. This state machine is for a different case of controller parameters, but I think this detail is not so important. But what results is a switching sequence, which is always you are for. You start maybe in the subsystem zero, and then you switch to the first one, to the second one, to the first one, to the second one. So this is a fundamental switching sequence which is always repeated. Okay. So, but since we have a mechanical system, there are uh, several intuitive properties for this subsystem. So what we can say is that each subsystem, um, to each subsystem you can correspond a Japanov function, which is just the total energy, again the kinetic and the potential energy, and we have a damping term in the plant, so we know that this energy in each subsystem is always non-increasing. So we know each subsystem is asymptotically stable. But that is, that from, from that we cannot conclude that the whole system is asymptotically stable because we switch. And due to the switching, we maybe induce energy in the system. Okay, but we know something different. We know also that since we switch always at a constant position, so the threshold is constant where we switch, so from, from that, diagram we can see that we always induce a constant amount of energy into the system. So
For example, when we start with initial condition such that we first time reach the threshold, then, then we switch to subsystem, I, to, to subsystem one. So then we are in subsystem one, but since there the potential energy is higher than at the switching point where we would switch back, the system goes in the direction to the switching point and then we switch from subsystem one to two. Then two is already at a higher potential as the switching point, so the system will evolve back to the switching point and switch back to subsystem one. And this arrow shows the, the, the amount of energy which is induced in the system due to the switching between the systems. And this is always constant. It's constant and always at constant positions. Okay. The only thing which would worry here, you see the, the phase diagram, diagram here. So here the dashed line is the switching and the solid line is the, is the continuous trajectory in the state plane. And the only thing which would vary is the velocity at the switching point. This here is indicated by the green arrows. Okay, so yeah, we have constant switching position, constant switching amplitudes. And what we can s see from here also, so this one is the trajectory in one subsystem, and we can see that this, this is the deflection which we, which we have from the starting point to the, to, the, to the end point of the continuous trajectory. And what we can see here, this, this, this amount is also constant. That means we, we switch at constant position, we switch by a constant amount, and during the continuous subsystem, the potential energy exchange is also constant. And what we can see also is that the energy input due to the switching is only potential energy because we change only the position, the position of the spring, and therefore we change only the potential energy. And that's the, that's the, that's the only energy which we induce in the system. So as a result, we can say, if we consider now the energy exchange for one cycle, that means we start here at the entry point of one subsystem make a whole cycle, and when we reach here, we look what is the difference in the energy to the starting point. And we, we know that we have during the subsystem, we have both kinetic and potential energy. This one is the switching, this one is the, 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 the energy exchange in the second subsystem, and this one is the, the energy exchange due to the switching. And what we know also is that the energy exchange due to the switching is equal to the energy exchange in one subsystem, uh, the potential energy exchange in one subsystem. So what comes out is that the energy exchange over the whole cycle is purely kinetic energy. And we also know from that, from, from the property that our total system energy is non-increasing, we, we also know that the energy exchange over one cycle is bounded. So in the, in the Brannicke paper, there's a theorem which states that if this constant is lower or equal zero, then we are stable. But that means that we would have a, sorry, a Lyapunov function for the, for the whole system, so for, the, for all subsystem. And this assumption is, is here not fulfilled because we know that this energy exchange is not, not equal or lower than zero. 
Okay, so we have to look at different properties of the system. So we know now that the energy exchange is only kinetic, but we still have to show that we, we are stable so that we are on a limit cycle as, as depicted here. So therefore the idea is to show that the energy exchange over one cycle goes to zero for if the iterations, okay, are for the iteration, go, yeah? Can you give any example of uh, like hybrid system that you're spending, let's say, in robotics, or you will introduce it later? Yeah, that, that I introduced already before. So that's, that's the hybrid system I consider. So actually, yeah, maybe you can explain it more, more intuitive. So you can consider it's just a mass and a spring. And at one end of the spring, where it's not the mass, you have the motor. And this one, you move only stepwise. Huh? That's what I showed in the video before. And that's already a hybrid system because you switch. So your states are not changing continuously, but you switch them. And for, after each switching, you have a, a subsystem. And if you combine all these subsystems, then you have a hybrid system. OK, and um, the idea of the stability statement is to show that the energy exchange over one cycle goes to zero. And then we have a paper on the IFAC where the details of the proof of this statement are in. So it's, um, but um, it's, I think it's intuitive. So if the energy exchange is zero over one cycle, then you have to, again, reach the same point in the state space. And we have to show that, so for, for infinite iteration, this, this is satisfied. So here's the picture of, so you start here, and then here, the distance between this point, uh, so between the limit cycle, the outer trajectory, and, and, and the starting trajectory decreases from one cycle to the next cycle until you reach the limit cycle. So that's actually the idea of the stability statement. So you have one nominal trajectory, which corresponds to zero energy exchange. And then you have a neighboring trajectory, which corresponds to non-zero energy exchange. And what you want to show is that the neighboring trajectories are converging to the nominal ones. And yeah, that actually means that these points here, these are the switching points, are contracting. And that is what we want to show. So the, maybe the summary of the stability statement is that we want to show convergence of the energy exchange, which is equivalent to contraction of neighboring trajectories to the nominal trajectory. And this is, this is equivalent to convergence to the limit cycle. OK, um, I guess I will skip this slide. So the first idea was to use contraction analysis. I don't know if someone familiar with contraction analysis. So I guess then I will, I, I will skip this. So, and yeah, the outcome when we looked at contraction analysis is that we cannot directly apply it because um, contraction analysis considers virtual di displacements, which mean at fixed times. But if you have trajectories of different lengths, time in times so of different duration, and you can, cannot compare them at, uh, at, at one point. So if, if I run this inner trajectory, this is already at the switching point after a certain time, but the outer trajectory maybe needs more time. 
to reach the switching point. So you cannot compare if they are contracting to each other. So we cannot apply little displacement and contraction analysis. And yeah, therefore we looked at the different method. So how we can extend this, and that would be if you don't look at fixed time, but at fixed positions. So what the idea is to show that the trajectories are contracting if you consider the distance of, the, of these trajectories at position, at one position, and then at the, uh, at the next position. And if you can show that from one to the next position, they are contracting, then you know that they are converging to each other. And that's basically the idea in behind. I guess I also won't show the details of it. Yeah, maybe one thing of, for, for them who followed until this point. So in the plot here, it looks like that they are not contracting. So that's a plot of the real system but it only looks like that because it depends on the metric you use. So here, when you use as metric the total energy of the system, then you can show that they are contracting. But I guess I will, I will not explain the stability analysis in more detail or, want, or does someone want to you more details about the stability analysis? Okay. okay. Yeah, then I give only a summary of that, of that method. Okay, we have a stability statement of based on multiple Yapanov functions for the subsystem. And stability, but the whole stability can for, the, for our system, so for the limit cycle system, can be shown only on based on an extension of contraction analysis. And yeah, but one thing is important because with this method we can show that we have a we have a method to excite or to generate a limit cycle um, which is an alternative to the Van der Poel oscillator. And yeah, for the Van der, Van der Poel oscillator you need some, you need derivatives and model knowledge which we don't need for our method. And with, with, the, with the whole analysis which I try to present um, one can show that also our method for some controller para, uh, configurations, parameter configurations, is more efficient than the Van der Poel oscillator, which is maybe an a important result, which, which, which you get only if you make this, this complex analysis. Yeah, and it shows also that, the, that this, this method of limit cycle generation based on the switching is very robust because you need no model or no, no parameters for the model and you need no derivative of measured signals which makes the method very robust. Okay, so to maybe for, to wake up now, so we are at this point. We have this example of the swing and we solved the problem of the timing of the excitation, so when we have to push the system. And now we have to solve the problem of how can we find the proper direction of the excitation in the multiple degree of freedom case. So just as a, as a reminder here, um, and this we will do by a method by an uh, adaptive method, which, uh, which, uh, which, which adapts to the oscillation mode of the system. And yeah, this one can be explained based on these pictures. So 
what what we want to have is we want a one direction one dimensional motion so oscillation can be always represented by one coordinate and yeah <coughs> but what we have is we have an n dimensional space of the of the multiple degree of freedom robot and and what we want to have is a coordinate transformation which reduces us from the n-dimensional space to a one-dimensional space. And what we can do to find this is we can, can define an error as the squared distance between here our original n-dimensional coordinates at a certain time and then the a mapping to the one-dimensional space and back. So if, if, we, if we go in this direction and back, then we should be, should be at the same point as we started. So if we parameterize this transformation by some parameters, maybe linear, maybe nonlinear, parameterized, then, and we make the difference between them and minimize this difference, then we, if, the, if, the, if this error is zero, then we should have, or then we have found the proper mapping. <coughs> but in general, this is very, the, there are many other conditions on the mapping, which, which would, when you don't, <laughs> when you don't know them, the, maybe if you make an optimization problem out of it, and if you search for these parameters of the mapping, then you will probably you, you will probably land in some local minimas, and you will never find the. That's I think you all know the problems of nonlinear optimization, and that's. But for our transformation to the one-dimensional space. We, and for the controller, we need something which co where we know that it converges. So the idea is that here we have the nonlinear coordinate, and we approximate them by locally always by linear ones. And for the linear ones, we know how this mapping should look like. So for the for the linear one, we can say that our, that here. W is a, are, are the, are something like eigenvectors or principal components, and, and they, they should be orthogonal to each other, and that's our condition. And this orthogonal one we can easily <laughs> find. And that means that we always get only an approximation, but if of, of our, our coordinate, of our nonlinear coordinate, but that could be already sufficiently. So, in summary, we can say we take the bang bang controller for the timing. Then we assume that we have already found such a mapping by maybe by a, by a recursive optimization of the of this error function. Yeah. So, so that we can transform our torques from the n-dimensional space to the one-dimensional space. Then we can apply this controller in the one-dimensional space, and then we, we transform back the resulting steps in the motor position to our n-dimensional space. So this can be explained with this picture. So, um, Initially, we start with a guess of our transformation. Yeah? And we push the system maybe in one of the wrong directions, but in the, in the meanwhile, we make our adaptation for our W, and the next time, when we hit the system by the controller, we are closer to the correct direction. And this one is repeated as long as we are tangential to our oscillation mode. So it's a result of, of both of the it's only possible because you have the switching controller because you cannot 
if you if you need continuously a correct transformation over the whole over the whole part of the oscillation mode, that would be then then this W would be wrong. But here, since we excite the system only only instantaneously, only once or twice per cycle, this works. So from cycle to cycle, we adapt to a to a sufficiently accurate approximation of this of this coordinate. Yeah. Maybe another feature of this whole controller is that it can be represented by a biological neural network where uh, a colleague of mine is now working on the whole proof from, from side of neuroscience that we can represent this as a biological neural network, so not a computational one, but a biological one. Okay. And yeah, then this experiment, uh, this controller is also applied to, the, to our robot for a cyclic hitting task. I hope the video starts. Yeah. So maybe the video looks a bit boring, but the important thing is that we have the multiple degree of freedom system, so multi-body system with nonlinear springs. We have contacts, so we have also a hybrid dynamics. And this controller, which is based only on measurements, so no model knowledge, no, no high derivatives, can, uh, can excite and sustain a, a hitting motion here, a cyclic motion. OK, and maybe more interesting or more pop popular are the application to to leg system so the controller can be applied to a jumping system and it adapts always to the intrinsic system properties of the plant huh? so here yeah, I have a different video where we just shift the center of mass and all the remaining controller parameters are constant and then you get out a forward jumping motion instead of a vertical jumping motion. And then if you change the configuration of the legs, the controller adapts to a completely different motion. So something like a crawling motion. That's only based on, actually based on measurements of the, of the motor and the link position with no model knowledge. So the only assumption on the model is the structure of the model that we have always the motor, spring, and the bodies, the rigid bodies. Okay, um, yeah. The summary of this part, so we have an adaptation of the intrinsic oscillation dynamics only based on measurements. <coughs> and yeah, we have no model of the plant in the controller. And the whole approach is only possible due to the combination of the switching controller with the adaptation. Are there questions at this point? Yeah. Uh, in the first part, you said that uh, with nonlinear springs, you have a uh, uh, quite complex uh, frequency response. Uh, yeah. And uh, let me say, strange. Uh, yeah. Unintuitive behavior. Unintuitive, um, yeah. Why do you choose uh, uh, a nonlinear spring instead of a linear spring? Why, why yeah, the, I, I don't choose the spring, but the spring is usually a result of the design of the VSA because if you want to have uh, adjustable spring characteristic, so maybe 
Bram Vanderborg maybe can explain it better, but then you usually need to have some non-linearities to, to, to have the spring char characteristic adjustable. So from, from a control point of we, we do not really want to have non-linear springs, but it's, I think it's a result of the design. Oh. Or I, I don't know a variable stiffness design for which with a linear torque deflection characteristic. Yeah, that's another issue, yeah. And also, uh, yeah. I don't think if you uh, reach the end position of the, the deflection of the rope, and then if you have density behavior, then you will not reach the end limit because then you have sticking behavior, so it more becomes more difficult to reach the end position of the deflection of the Yeah, that's also true. Yeah. And also, Yeah, that's also yeah, true. Yeah. Many designs have design. yeah, we're designing at time also a lag with with uh, serial elastic actuators, and we have with constant springs, we have really really problems in the knee because we need such a high stiffness yeah. when we are yeah, because it should be stiffened up if you if you bend flex your bend your knee. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, but one more comment. Um, with the switching, since you, if you switch, you are independent of the excitation frequency. So you don't have to think about which frequency should my excitation have, because in the switching, you have theoretically infinite bandwidth. That's, that's only a comment on, another comment on this. Okay, so, yeah, I presented first a model-based method and then the model-free method, so we can compare them a little bit, so. Sure, if you, if you use the whole model of the plant, you can, change your system dynamic to a large extent. So you can make out of a horse, a car, or you have many possibilities. But therefore, you will need high derivatives and so on. And you won't be such efficient if you, because if you, if you force the system to behave completely different from its natural behavior, then you need a lot of actuator power. And but <coughs> one advantage is that for the model-based approaches, the stability analysis is, is way easier than for the, for the model-free one. But in the model-free case, you are very robust against parameter uncertainties and you need no only measurements of, of the states at position level and since you excite the intrinsic dynamics uh, the intrinsic oscillation behavior of the plant you are potentially more efficient and yeah but there is one disadvantage so since you just excite the intrinsic dynamics of the plant and um, maybe the resulting motion does not fit to your task what you want. So you have to, to adapt your 
design of your plant to your to fit to the task. And yeah, that's why I come to the next method. In the next me method, I I try to combine both methods. So the the, the yes, sorry. So before Limit cycle analysis is uh, quite comfortable to use the popular mapping arguments. So uh, I did recommend some similar arguments in your survey group, but I was wondering is there a particular reason why this technique would be less adapted uh, to this uh, analysis, or you didn't consider this kind of analysis? Yeah, for, for the point to, to get the Poincare map. You, Poincaré map is a numerical analysis, and for to get the Poincaré map, you have to simulate the system. So what you get out of the analysis with the Poincaré map is just a, just a, 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 a statement which is only locally valid, only in the vicinity of the the point which you consider, and. With this analysis, you can make global statements without simulating the system. Or does it does it answer your question? Okay. So the next cyclic motion method is. So the, the motivation, therefore, was since we moved from, let's say, robot arms to to system with legs, and for leg system, the tasks are very clearly specified. So, and since for the model free, the model free method, we can excite only the the intrinsic plant dynamics, but for the for the walking or jumping or running tasks we need to specify how the resulting cyclic motion should be. So therefore, we, make a, we combine somehow this, 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 this model-based and the model-free approach to get a controller where we can specify the, let's say, the direction of your, of your oscillation mode. So, yeah, what we consider therefore is our floating base system, as leg system are usually floating base system, and yeah, inertia and so on is one of the rigid body dynamics. But <coughs> one important thing is that this system is at one point subject to contact constraints, so at the foot. And yeah, we assume that we have a damping, as in every physical system. And this, the system is also compliantly actuated. So in the joints, you have a VSA or a SCA mechanism. So the torque, which acts on the rigid body dynamics, resides from a spring or from springs. OK. so. For the approach, it's important that the, the relation between the spring deflection and the torque should be invertible, which is for physical springs also always the case, so that we can use again the torque on the rigid body dynamics and the motor position as equivalent control inputs. Yeah. Then let me explain the idea of the control approach. So again, let me repeat that what we want is to have to, we want to specify the direction of the oscillation. So therefore we first consider some, some task coordinates because here the joint coordinates are not, not really intuitive and maybe our task will be to jump in a certain direction. So this only as an example, let's consider the, the position of the total center of mass of the system. 
And then consider an equivalent if so the total center of mass position can is, is, is a function of the configuration variables of the rigid robot. And now we consider an equivalent out of computed out of the motor variables. So that means if so if there is no gravity and so on, if both points coincide, then we have no torques in the joints. So that's the definition of this equilibrium center of mass position. And then we consider a desired direction of our oscillation. So mathematically, that's, that should be a one-dimensional submanifold of this of the Rn, so of the Euclidean, of the n-dimensional space of the robot. So then what we need, or what the idea is of the approach is we have one controller part, so which, which, which is, for example, a very strong PD controller, which forces the motion of the, of the CUM to be on this one-dimensional sub-manifold. So you can imagine it's a virtual spring which always pushes you here to the desired direction. And then, but to change the system not too much, then in the direction, in the desired direction, we project the spring the springs of the joints. So this one, so on the submanifold, or on the desired direction, we consider the reflected impedance of the joints. And then, so if we then if we have the control which which pulls us on the manifold, and if if we are on the manifold, we can apply the bang bang control on the man manifold. So in the desired direction. Okay, and to construct this manifold, here we can define here these coordinates, as I have explained here, the position of the total COM and the position of the reflected one, which is here in a three-dimensional space. And then we, what we know from differential geometry if, is if we define a constraints of dimension two, then or the result is a one-dimensional submanifold, as desired. So and yeah, if you take the potential and from from the potential you can derive the forces in the constraint direction resulting from the spring. And these are the, the corresponding Jacobians. And as we know from Park and so on, we can, this, this Jacobians um, have a null space. And if we consider the null space of this Jacobian, then we com compute the, f the force which results from the springs in the joints in the direction of the submanifold. And this force will be required <laughs> for, the, for the controller. OK, then let me first explain the controller design in this task coordinate, in this center of mass coordinate. So, this one is the strong PD part to push the system on the desired direction. Then here we have the torque in the direction, in the de desired direction. And for this torque, we can implement the bang bang control here, which is here represented by this delta. So we have the, the torque of the resulting from the springs, and if we put a delta on it, it's equivalent as 
making a step on the motor position. Okay, so what we have changed in the system is we have this PD controller in, instead of tau z, instead of the, the impedance in the constraint direction, and we added this bang bang term. That's, that's the only change which we did with the system. Yeah. A not so important issue this controller is expressed in a Cartesian frame, and this, this Cartesian frame. As, as, as a lower dimension than our joint space. So we need some implementation of the joint torque. So we need a method to, to come from the, from the lower dimensional cartes from our task space to a higher dimensional space of our actuators. And this can be done by, so here we propose two methods. One is based on a now space compliance, which actually keeps the configuration, some initial configuration of the robot in the null space. And in the task case, it performs the control, which I explained before. Yeah, I think I don't have to go in detail there, though that's that are basics of impedance control, which you maybe know already. And yeah, another method would be to optimize the contact forces which result due to, due to the controller. So one can map the contact forces to the, to the joint torques. And then one can project at one point the, the the forces which are required for the for the task controller to the joint torque and they should be equal to the forces resulting from the contact forces and we then we can define a cost function for the main task and maybe for the null space task but the important thing is that we could involve that we could consider also task constraints such as friction constraints and so on. So we could implement in the controller that we avoid slippage, for example. Okay, these are the two, two possibilities we suggest to implement the, the controller at joint level. Okay, so there we have some simulations. So one is just with the null space compliance. And it's not running. Now my computer is computing something. We have to wait a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah, but we can skip maybe. All, yeah, I know it's running. So, in, in, in on the right side, you see that there is no slippage because of the optimization. But you have to run an optimization at every time step. And in the left one, if it starts again. There was slippage, so that's the only difference. But maybe the more important thing is um, the application to. So what we wanted to do is to to define, predefine the direction of the oscillation. So for a jumping task, that would be maybe vertical jumping or forward jumping, and this can be shown by this video. So we start with vertical jumping, then we tilt the desired manifold, then it jumps forward, and then we put it again vertical, and then it stops. And yeah, the reviewer complained that it's that it's a big difference between 2D and 3D, so you can show it also in 3D. You 
can um, predefine also a sideward jumping motion. What was it? I don't know. I replayed the video. First it's forward and then the desired manifold is shifted to the right and then it's jumping sideward. Okay. So let me summarize this approach. So with this approach, you can predefine the direction of your oscillation mode by control. And yeah, but the dynamics of the plant are only changed in the direction of the constraint. So in the desired direction, we use the intrinsic behavior of the plants too. And yeah, the v thereby the VSA spring are exploited on the oscillation mode. So we can still exploit this energy pumping properties. For example, during the jumping tasks, we can put, put the energy portion-wise into the system. And yeah, for the control approach, we need only a static model. That means a geometric model. So the kinematics at position level, then a model of the springs, and a model of the center of mass. No dynamic model. OK. Other questions at this point? Or should we make a short break? So I have a last part, which, which is approximately 15 minutes, which is about running. So application to bipedal running. Maybe it's good to make five minutes break, or just go on. Okay. Or I can skip it also. Yes? <coughs> it's a combination of okay. both. Yeah, so let's see. So we, we use we use a geometric model, we use a spring model, and we use a center of mass model for this approach. But these are no dynamic models. Are all, they are all only position dependent, or dependent on position variables. And the last part is to apply this switching bang bang concept of limit cycles generation or cyclic motions to more complex, more advanced tasks. And the task which we choose therefore is uh, running. So you know this video already. But that's that, that was a question which we asked a while ago if we can extend the controller such that we can apply it also to more complex tasks. And this work was a collaboration with, with, with Christian Rode from University of Jena and also University of Darmstadt. I think he's part-time also and Andre Seifert was also involved in this work. So 
we try to combine this their biological findings with our control approaches. So, yeah, the question was of if we can extend this concept here only for, which I presented already for a mass, or if we can transfer these principles to bipedal running. Um, the idea behind is that, first of all, we have for the running task, we have some task-oriented coordinates. And based on these task coordinates, we, we are looking for a system design which fits to these task coordinates, maybe which have these task coordinates already as an intrinsic property. And then we can, with <coughs> But with with very few control actions, um, reach the running tasks, or achieve the running tasks, and the hope is that the, we thereby excite the intrinsic dynamics of the system and also exploit it, so be then very efficient. That's the idea, and the the coordinates actually came from the from biological considerations so if you here consider one leg here then you have the hip and the hip is for maybe controlling the posture of your trunk that you balance don't fall down and but the hip is also required to place your foot during the walking tasks. Then you have a leg axis, which is actually con the connection between the hip joint and the ankle joint. The leg axis is responsible for weight bearing, bearing the weight of your whole body. Then the leg axis, so the length of the leg axis should be reduced in the swing phase to achieve ground clearance. And I think humans does it not, but it, the leg axis can also be used to induce energy into the system. Okay, and then we have the ankle joint, which is responsible for energy injection and for the push off after the stance phase. So, but for our articulated, so this this model is quite similar to to slip models and so on. So without the without the foot. But for for our for our um, robot or our, also in humans, we have good reasons to have an articulated leg. So if we are in we have obstacles, then it has advantages. There are many advantages to have an articulated leg. So these are our, our original coordinates, are the hip rotation, the knee rotation, and the ankle rotation. And these are our, let's say, task-oriented coordinates. So the hip rotation with respect to the leg axis, then the leg axis, and the ankle joint rotation with respect to the leg axis. Okay, and based on these task-oriented coordinates, you can define a specific actuator design due to couplings of springs. So this, this was found from biology and geometric considerations, but if you define here actuator coordinates which, which, uh, which result in a coupling here of this one uh, like uh, lever arms represent lever arms, the red one are lever arms of the motors and here the, the other one are joints the green one are the springs, so for if you consider a coupling of ratio 2 to 1 to the 
to the knee joint, so that's a biarticular muscle. And if you consider a one-to-one -one actuation from for the knee joint, acts in addition to this biarticular muscle. And, and if you consider a one-to-two coupling for the for the ankle between the knee and the ankle joint. Then, as I will show later, you will achieve uh, the, the, the decoupling in the task-oriented coordination which I defined before. So, one comment on this. So, as long as we have actuators, which we can represent in this coordinates, delta 1, delta L1, delta L2, delta L3, it doesn't matter if we have here springs or we can have also rigid connection, but we would always result in this advantage, advantageous uh, behavior in the task coordinates. So, for example, what you can show for every spring potential, which you can express in this form. So, each of the potentials, u1, u2, and u3, for itself, have the properties of an elastic potential, positive definiteness, and so on. So if you can express the spring in the form, then the, the stiffness matrix, so the Hessian of this potential, has always this structure. So this structure, you can see that you have a, this band structure, that you have always a coupling between the joints. Yeah. This, this is in, in coordinates, in joint coordinates, in the original coordinates of the articulated leg. But if we express this stiffness matrix in our task-oriented coordinates, then they are decoupled. So that means that with each motor, we can move the leg decoupled from the other um, in the direction of one of our task-oriented coordinates. So that means that as a result of the, of the coordinates, so of the chosen coordinates and the system design, we can actuate the system task-specific in the, in the task-oriented coordinates without having the coupling. Yeah. Another implication is that it could be possible, it could be required that we need at some point a torque input. For example, for the hip we need a torque input, but for the, for the knee or for the leg axis we don't need a torque input, but we just want to hold the equilibrium position of the spring. Uh, but uh, a result of the actuator design is that we can, we can have this combination of torque input and motor position input as listed here. And the same is also valid in the task-oriented coordinates. So we could, for example, for the hip coordinate, we can make a PD controller, which needs the torque as input to balance the upper body. And for the ankle, we can just provide a controller, a switching controller for the, for the motor position. For example, to induce the, the push off. So the only control actions which we need for the, for the running task is we change the motor position based on the, the motor position before the switching and the configuration variables. So, for example, that could be an event, maybe touchdown, takeoff, and the other control action, which what we have is a PD control 
with gravity compensation for the upper body. These are the only main basic control principles which we need to generate the, the running task. And then we can def define again a finite dynamics, as you remember in the, in the analysis of the bang-bang controller. So that's just a state, mach state machine which switches between different either equilibrium uh, motor positions or the PD control, which I explained before. And then, for example, you have the touchdown, and then you need some functions. So zero hip torque, for example, because when you get in contact, you cannot start to directly control the upper body, because you, first you need a certain amount of of contact force that you that you will not slip at the ground, and therefore, for example, you start with zero zero hip torque, and you but you already bend your knee to have ground clearance, and then <coughs> so then you can check, for example, for a delta. In the, in the leg force, so in the new coordinate, in the task oriented coordinate, you can look in the leg axis if, if you have a, reached a certain threshold, and then you can start control actions as posture control of the upper body, foot placement, weight bearing, bearing is not really a control action because you just, you just hold the position of your stance, the motor position, of the, which corresponds to the legs axis in, of the stance leg to a constant position. And yeah, then you can induce the push off by giving the step on the corresponding coordinate, motor coordinate. And yeah, then you have to the, the take off with foot placement and prepare for landing. So in summary, the one in red are the PD control actions. So, and the other one are only actions where, where the motor position are changed stepwise. So this is a simulation where it converged first to, uh, I think, it should converge to about 2.0 meter per second forward velocity. And then if it's converged after a while, the velocity will increase, so the desired velocity. And what we can show here is that, so in contrast, for example, to the slip model, this is an articulated model with, with real, real inertias in the leg. And what we can show is that we converge, we can converge to several forward running velocities. What we can also show that we can run upward a, a slope So the summary for this part is so we found some task oriented coordinates representing the functionalities of, of running um, and a system design which fits to these coordinates intrinsically and therefore we need only very minimal control actions because the system already fits to our tasks and therefore we can excite the natural system dynamics and are potentially energy efficient. So yeah, the last step were only simulations till now, but we are building a time for uh, first a small leg and parallel also a big leg 
And here are first experiments, if they start. Uh, of a vertical jumping motion. So the next step is to extend to a second leg and then also implement the, the forward jumping and the, the running. Yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Are there some last questions? first tried walking, but walking is much more complex task than running. And so we succeeded only with running, but we still, still tried also for walking. <laughs>